Hello, everyone. I'm Catherine Cobb, Metals and Mining Industry Marketer here at Aspen Tech, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Avoid Unplanned Downtime with Prescriptive Maintenance. I'm first going to go over some housekeeping. During the presentation, all participants will be in listen-only mode. The audio for today's presentation is being broadcast over your computer speakers. If you experience trouble with the audio broadcast, you may dial in via the audio conference phone line instead. To do this, select more options at the bottom of the screen under the icon with the three dots. Select switch audio, select call an option. Then follow the dial in instructions that appear on your screen. For optimal content viewing, you can locate the viewing options near the top right of the content window. We recommend choosing side-by-side -side view, which is the second option in the middle. If you experience any problems with the WebEx portion of the event, please send us a message in the Q&A window by messaging the host for today's call. You can also contact WebEx technical support directly at 866-779 3239. For today's presentation, there will be a live Q&A session following today's speakers. Questions can be submitted at any time during the presentation by clicking on the Q&A tab located on the right-hand side of your screen. Please be sure to address your questions to all panelists so that we can ensure that we see them and are able to answer. If your question is not answered live, we will follow up after the event. As a reminder, this presentation is being recorded. A copy of the presentation and the webinar recording will be sent to all attendees in a few days. Now, for today's presentation, I would like to introduce our moderator, Steve Fitzcore, publisher and editor of Engineering and Mining Journal. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Steve to begin today's presentation. Steve, over to you. Thank you, Catherine. Hi, my name is Steve Fiskor, and I'm the uh, publisher and editor of Engineering and Mining Journal, the leading trade journal for the mining and mineral processing industry. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar on how to avoid unplanned downtime with prescriptive maintenance produced by Aspen Tech with the help of Capstone Mining. During this session, we will explore the benefits of increased digitalization for mining operations. I'll be serving as the moderator. The demand for precious metals and raw materials such as iron ore, base metals, and battery minerals continues to increase. Gold and silver are safe haven investments during times of economic uncertainty, and we've uh, certainly seen plenty of that lately. Iron ore is the main component for making steel and infrastructure development worldwide is pushing steel consumption and iron ore demand higher. Likewise, the expected shift toward battery electric vehicles is driving demand for other metals such as copper, nickel, lithium, cobalt, etc. Miners today are enjoying a healthy market, but they face their own set of issues that drive up costs and impact profit margins. One important factor is geology. Ore body grades have been declining for years. Mine operators today need to mine and crush more rock to produce the same amount of metals they did five or 10 years ago. One of the ways miners have held costs at bay was to rely on economies of scale to lower the cost per ton. They invested in larger haul trucks, larger fleets of trucks, larger shovels, high capacity overland conveyors, and planned expansions. Availability is key for these types of programs to succeed. An idle haul truck, an offline conveyor, or a plant running at partial capacity can cost a mining operation hundreds of thousands of dollars a day in lost production. To maintain availability and reliability, more mining companies are turning to digitalization to improve uptime. One of the best ways to reduce or eliminate downtime is a solid maintenance program for both stationary and mobile equipment. Modern miners understand the importance of maintenance and many mines excel at preventive maintenance programs. Whether the shop is on the surface, underground, or in the plant, mining maintenance crews strive for continuous improvement. To gain an edge and take advantage of data, many of these programs rely on data from monitoring systems such as oil and vibration analysis. These tools are useful for keeping tabs on the health and performance of various components, and even better tools are currently being developed and tested. 
Increased digitalization will allow those departments to take maintenance programs to the next level, prescriptive maintenance. The era of the intelligent mind is underway. The maintenance departments of the future will use insight and information to improve their decision-making ability based on data. Today we have two speakers. The first speaker is Ed Bardo, Director of Metals and Mining for Aspen Tech. Aspen Tech is a leading provider of enterprise asset performance and optimization solutions. Many mines are already using Aspen Tech software system, Aspen MTEL, a prescriptive maintenance solution to improve uptime. Our second speaker is Mike Wickersham, General Manager of Capstone's Pinnell Valley Copper Mine in Arizona. A bit of background. Capstone acquired the Pinot Valley mine from BHP in October 2013. The company, which is based in Vancouver, has invested steadily to improve its operations, a practice that continues today. They focused on a series of low capital, quick payback programs to uh, de bottleneck operational performance. The object was to improve copper production by 10% and lower costs by 10% by 2021. Not only are they going to exceed this goal, they did it during the COVID pandemic. In addition to improving blasting, loading, hauling, along with some mill upgrades, Capstone has also embraced some novel technologies and they are paying off as well. One of those would be Aspen MTEL, Aspen Tech's prescriptive maintenance solution. Today, Mike will share insights on Capstone's approach to digitalization and the challenges that drove their maintenance strategy. He will discuss how Aspen Tech provided the tools to empower Capstone's team to stay ahead of potential failures, in addition to the results achieved thus far with prescriptive maintenance, he will talk about the lessons learned in Capstone's journey and its next steps. And now I'll turn things over to Ed Bardo and I'll return for the Q&A session at the end of the discussion. Thank you very much, Steve. And uh, I'd like to echo your welcome to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. I think this is going to be an exciting discussion. And uh, I think what really makes these discussions relevant is when we have somebody in the industry dealing with these type of problems who can actually speak to them. So, oops, trying to move. Let's see if we can. Oh, I'm having a oops, minor issue here. Oh, there we go. Let's see if I can. Uh, So I'm having a minor issue with advancing here. Not quite sure why that's happening. I've lost the uh, presentation, sorry. Can someone advance for me? I'm sorry, I can't see the slides at the moment. We're having a slight issue here with things. I'd like to part, uh, say sorry here. We're just having a momentary technical issue. Hi, Ed. Did I advance the slides for you? Uh, yeah, could you please? I, I'm right now I'm zoomed in and I can't quite make out what I'm seeing here. It's right. also not advancing for some reason. Okay, we're on the safety share slide now. Okay, uh, first of all, everyone, of course, in true mining fashion, what I'd like to do here is start with a safety share. Um, most importantly, when we're in this uh, current time, as we're uh, traveling to sites or we're starting to renew activities as normal, one of the things that we're very familiar with is the concern for safety when operating near large equipment. And so, as we all know, that one of the greatest causes of high potential incidents within a mine are interactions with other vehicles. And so we know there are a lot of safety protocols that, that are dealt with on mine sites when, when, uh, when it comes to dealing with vehicle interactions. But what I wanted to point out today and share with you is the importance of paying attention to the drive to and from site, because this is one of those areas sometimes that we get so concerned with the, uh, uh, with the uh, work, uh, role that when we're driving back from work, sometimes we're tired, exhausted after the shift, and perhaps we're a little bit less attentive than we should be. So I'd just like to take a moment in the safety share to remind everyone that as we've been kind of sitting during the pandemic and uh, not really uh, driving probably as much as we used to be driving, 
that uh, it's, a t it's definitely worth making sure that we focus and, be, and keep safe, but for our families, for everyone around us, for work, and just make sure that uh, as we return to driving regularly, as we're driving to and from site, as we're paying attention to work, that vehicle interactions are a leading cause of uh, injury and incidents. Let's try to avoid that. So thank you everyone for that. Now let's begin with the, uh, let's begin now talking about what we're gonna uh, do today. Today we're going to be talking uh, about quite a bit about digitization and mining, and one of the key things is we're going to be talking about prescriptive maintenance, a big win for digital technology and mining. We'll start by a quick introduction that I'll give you in this space and how digitization can impact mining, and then we'll transition over to a discussion with uh, Mike Wickersham, as uh, previously introduced, to talk about the actual journey that occurred at Pinto Valley Mine. I think you'll find this fascinating uh, hearing from Mike and his journey, and as he deployed MTEL at site, how he was able to make uh, specific changes necessary to truly realize the value there, and the type of decisions that went into go to beginning and taking this journey. So I think you'll find that interesting. And then as we advance here, we're going to go to the Q and A session. I think most of you will notice that there's a Q&A panel to the right side of your screen, and if you would like at any time to enter questions there, we'll, we'll be able to address those. So please, as you're moving along and you come up with a question, feel free to, uh, feel free to enter it there. Next slide. And so in talking about prescriptive maintenance, we can go ahead and advance to the uh, next one. Okay. One of the things that we constantly, many of us who work in mining have dealt with is that as we're describing mining, often to folks who are not in that particular industry, they think of it as basically digging stuff up out of the ground and uh, somehow it ending, up, uh, ending up out there into the market. But the reality of what mining is is sometimes it's a bit invisible to them. When we look at the total life cycle of mining, we start at the we start at the very early stages that most people don't think about that involves the uh, exploration where geologists, uh, uh, mining engineers, folks are involved doing exploration, planning, feasibility studies, trying to determine if the mine is going to be economically feasible and uh, trying to determine what will actually happen in the long term. To understand that in mining, the investment, of course, is a huge one that will not result in uh, actual payback for some time. So the amount of effort that goes here is critical. Then we move into the extraction phase, which is the phase that most people associate with mining, where actually pulling stuff out the ground, the load and the haul, the traditional digging stuff up. Then, of course, in order to turn that into something people can use, we go into the processing phase, turning it into the separating the actual ore, getting the grades that we want, and then we transport that out to market and uh, it, where it is sold. But of course, an important aspect that also exists is the reclamation phase. When the mine is finished, actually bringing that back in, that piece of land back into the environment in a friendly manner. So this entire process can last decades to many decades. And digital technologies nowadays are beginning to assist in, in, in maximizing the op operational benefits that are possible with this technology. So, for example, digital technology can improve, create safer operations, can help you meet your sustainability objectives. One of the things that's very, very important for us operationally, of course, is to improve yields. Just using digital technology alone can help us optimize operations to improve higher yields and move increased tonnage. So digital technology is not something that is just a newfangled technology out there. It is actually something that can actually transform mining in a very, very productive and safe way. Next slide. So what, one of the things I'm gonna focus on uh, in particular is combining the extraction, the uh, processing, transport and market phase, and calling this the production phase. We wanna look at very specific things that can be done in this space, uh, look specifically at what we could do to achieve more quality, improve things using certain digital drivers. And in this case, we're gonna focus on the very rubber meets the road type of technology that will help in this space, which is predictive prescriptive maintenance. I think that uh, this particular uh, digital technology is very interesting because of the capability of this technology to quickly introduce a return on investment and solve a fundamental problem that exists in mining, which is the 
unplanned downtime of critical equipment. I think between all of us, if we think about the possibility of a piece of equipment going uh, uh, going down without a, out of plan, that really kind of makes the hair stand up on your back of your neck. It truly transform whether or not you're going to meet plan for the day or during that shift. So what we'll talk about now, next slide, is how prescriptive maintenance can actually do that. So what I've got here is an image that represents the uh, kind of the mining process in that space. So if you look here kind of towards the top, you can see a continuous miner and some traditional load and haul happening here. So we're in the extraction phase and you can see the process kind of moving as we get it down to the crusher, to conveyors, taking it into the processing plant and moving that all the way out to we, we, we get out to port. So this is a true image of pit to port. When we think about what the potential of losing a critical piece of capital equipment. Let's imagine uh, we lose something upstream in this particular case. Let's go ahead and click on that, uh, Steve. And you can imagine losing a critical piece of equipment here. Like say in this case, we lose the uh, continuous miner here up front. So we're monitoring, this thing is uh, just in traditional maintenance mode and suddenly this goes down. Just like that, everything downstream is impacted. Okay, it's ju not just that piece of equipment, it's everything downstream that has the impact of this one pe piece of equipment that, uh, that goes down. And so this is truly an area of value uh, that digital technology such as predictive prescriptive maintenance can impact immediately. So let's take a look at how that works. Next slide, please. So in many cases with, he with heavy capital equipment, uh, whether it be mobile equipment, fixed equipment in the plant, conveyors, other types of components within them, we might have sensors that are monitoring these, or we've considered putting sensors to mon monitor these. So if you look at these traces that I'm showing you here, if you imagine that these traces are data coming in from those sensors, telling us kind of the status of that particular component or piece of equipment that we're monitoring, you don't need to know the details of what each of these colors means what you just could imagine is that this is in data coming in. By looking at this, obviously, I don't know about you, but by looking at this, I can't tell that there's going to be any problem in the near future. Next one. But suddenly we have an incident here. Did anybody see anything there that kind of told them that that was coming? And so this basically occurs and was very much unplanned. Next one. As we follow on, as time progresses, we can kind of then intuitively make out as we watch these lines kind of diverge and start to show more uh, more signs of issues. We can kind of make out then, yes, something's going on at this point, and we've got ourselves an issue, and we need to do something about it. But when we looked back at that early window, it was very difficult to see that. Now let's imagine a different situation here. Let's imagine now. Imagine if we were told way back here, uh, weeks potentially, months earlier that this was going to occur, that we had spotted something in that data that our eyes couldn't see, but digital technology could. And it looked through that and said, hey, something's going to happen. You've got some time to deal with it, but we're getting indicators that this is happening and that you have a potential for an incident in the future if you don't do something about it. So here we're talking about early warning, not just a day, not just a few days in advance, but early enough that we have time to do something about it. And not only that, there's an additional benefit here. If you, if you deal with a problem close to failure point, there's a likelihood that you have uh, da uh, collateral damage, damage that was done just before the item went into failure to other components in the system that were stressed due to the, the failing component. So this is, this is pretty important to get advance warning with time to deal with it, and also in advance of before you get any type of collateral damage. But in addition, Next, imagine if you were to get context information about what gave us that and probability information about what made us get that type of warning about an advanced warning on failure. So imagine now we're able to look at this and say, oh, these particular sensors contributed and started to give us information that gave us the context to understand why we were getting this failure warning. And so not just a, a predictive warning, but a prescriptive one that allows us to take actions that can tell us to do something with the contextual information and the probabilities that we're given to potentially take actions to prevent this from happening in the future. 
And so now, rather than waiting for a problem to occur in a reactive mode, we're actually now to, able to take uh, steps in advance. Next slide. So the, this is not just theory anymore. Nowadays, uh, prescriptive predictive maintenance is something that is being that MTEL is helping solve in sites around the world. What I've got here is various examples, real examples with real value captured uh, listed here. For example, a continuous miner on a particular site that calculated a 300,000 years cost savings based on the advanced warning and information that was given to prevent that from failing. Or a haul truck where the services reduction, a 10% services reduction that gives savings and keeps uptime on the, this expensive capital equipment. Or imagine the case of, of, a, of a crusher conveyor system for 500,000 in savings for keeping that in operation and knowing that when a catch occurred, a failure was predicted, we were able to deal with it potentially within the normal maintenance window or deal with it at a time to prevent extensive downtime. To, to understand, MTEL works across the board and anything from mobile equipment to fixed equipment of plant like this mill where the fail repair times reduced by 30%. Next, one more click there. And the nice thing about using this type of technology is it's very scalable. And so the time to implement it is very quick and the value capture is huge. So if we think, take the example of mobile equipment, if we develop a, a, an idea, we develop agents, technology, we use MTEL to identify the type of failure modes we expect on that truck, we can quickly scale that on other similar trucks and take and expand and scale this value. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and uh, I think we're going to begin our discussion with Mike. Um, and. Uh, Talk to Mike. Mike is uh, at uh, Capstone's Pinto Valley mine, has implemented MTEL a, a while back, and he's had some experience. He's had quite a bit of experience in this space. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, talk a bit about this. Looking forward. To it. So, one of the things, of course, is, uh, is that when you get this digital technology, Mike, um, there are a lot of different things that uh, were out there, a lot of different problems that you could have solved and stuff. What challenges or opportunities did you see that these digital solutions providing specific to maintenance? What was kind of your driver there for maintenance uh, a solution in digital? Well, uh, for our site, one of the things that was particularly important was um, uh, to make sure we had a, a simple short list of things we wanted to focus on and for us it was leadership simplicity was a, a theme in itself and the, the second one was to make sure that we're um we're maintenance centric right so um if if you're going to keep these assets running at full capacity on uh, safely and at high reliability you've got to have a team that are focused on maintenance and one of the challenges we found was there are a lot of different tools out there that that can help you uh Im improve your maintenance efforts and and some of those are digital some of them are not but when you look at those tools um, that are out there, a lot of them focus on trying to crunch a, a vast sea of data and give you some information so you have some understanding of how your assets are performing. And what we found in MTEL is it was the only one that really had that maintenance-centric view of data analytics, Ed. You know, there, there are a lot of choices out there and a lot of them uh, seem to have the objective of just crunching the numbers and looking for trends or looking for correlations. This one specifically is focused out on trying to anticipate and understand potential failure modes or departures from steady state normal operating modes. And we, we found that to be challenging um, in, in selecting which uh, uh, platform we wanted to use. So that, that's one for sure. Um, I think I alluded to the other one on that is we're just swimming in a sea of data now, even at an old site like mine, it was originally built in 1974. We progressively added more or expanded the digital footprint onto the physical assets. And we're at a funny time in history as operators right now where there's all this information that's out there and we haven't yet got the right data analytics or AI tools really soundly in place and the people to understand what those results mean, Ed. And so we're a bit overwhelmed and getting a source like MTEL with those graphs that you saw for all these discrete variables is the solution to deal with all that um, that data that sits out there that's underutilized if you don't have the right technology to translate it into action and information. And so you uh, you had quite the quite the change there at hand dealing with this, and uh, you look like it looks like you had quite the opportunity within uh, the maintenance realm to use this technology. Did you uh, did you have any concerns for folks uh, kind of resisting that? 
Well, yeah, every change has uh, uh, some folks who are you know, fast adapters and other folks who are a little bit slower to the party, right? Um, what we tried to do was get our reliability team excited about this capability, and that was a pretty easy sell because that's what these folks do for a living anyway. I think the potential resistance could be um, how do you ultimately translate that intel into action in your classic maintenance programs where you have work identification and work management? This is this is uh, um, electricians and millwrights going out and performing the work in the field, and the answer for that is you let Intel with this predictive capabilities um, create work orders that then get inserted to the classic maintenance program. So it's just another way to inspect and detect in the equipment gets inserted pretty quickly into a standing process, and then it just runs pretty nicely, honestly. So, so Mike, specifically at uh, Capstone there, how did you uh, how did you approach adding the new digital technologies at your site? I know a lot of folks are used to, as you bring in tech, certain technologies, they're used to kind of hardware, touchy-feely things. How did, uh, how did the approach to digital technologies, bringing that out to your site go? Well, it, it starts with uh, a pretty close cooperation with the, the vendor. So in, in uh, the case of Aspen Tech and Mtel, we had access to uh, your staff, uh, came out here, worked very closely with our staff. We socialized that work across um, uh, different work groups, specific starting on our, our processing fixed plant operations. But we're now engaging in conversations with our mobile fleet um, as well, because we see some application for it there. Fantastic. And uh, I think the question that everybody has is, as we talk about new technologies or new things we're bringing out to mine sites, there's always this discussion that we hear about change management. So how are you managing the adoption of these new digital technologies? How are it like Intel to ensure that they're successful? What's your kind of your recipe for success for that? Well, I, in, that's a really, I mean, that, that phrase is really important, change management. And um, what I have found to be uh, most successful hasn't come from my years in engineering. It's probably come more from my wife's experience in psychology. And that is you really got to focus on engagement. So. The folks who are uh, out there doing the work have to understand there's an opportunity that this opportunity might solve some of their problems, that it becomes part of the strategy that the site is going to use. So you, you've got to syndicate these ideas and you've got to do it with some real discussion with the people who are the end users and make them feel like their voices are heard, uh, that they're part of a connection to a larger strategy and that they're part of something important. And that change management, if you focus on the people engagement, Ed, for me is the most important part of it. Yeah, I've, I've had some experience myself in that space and, uh, you know, I think that that's often there's so much discussion about the technology that folks forget that it's the people who will have to do this. It will be the people who are the uh, actual resource and ingredient that uh, makes that recipe a success. Absolutely. And, and I think one of the things that's in a, a, a sustaining um, um, or factor that helps promote sustaining that whatever changes you've made is if, if it becomes just a project that a talented reliability engineer is working on. Uh, it may it may end or that that uh, technology may find itself kind of put on the shelf if that person leaves the organization. So what you want to do is, is, is take that talented person uh, with this vendor who can help you drive the change. Again, embed that into your standard processes. And then if some of these talented people move on to other roles, the process continues, right? And you can sustain the, uh, the improvements that you're making. Yes. Yeah, so did you have, did you have any, uh, you know, did you notice over time that as you were implementing this change that folks kind of felt a little bit antsy at first, but as time kind of moved on, there was kind of more of an acceptance. Absolutely. I, I think that's the, the, the representation of that is this willingness now to move into the, uh, the mobile equipment fleet, not just the fixed plant. So folks are becoming more accustomed to it and understanding what it means. Well, so a lot of the folks would say, well, if you're going through this, this effort with change management stuff and management. The big question would be, well, what value has something like Intel provided to your site? Why are you doing this? Well, you highlighted it pretty well, I think, with your intro that showed um, what the, the classic response is, is you've got all these tracking trends and indicators, and then you have a failure, and you go out and you respond to the failure. What, um, what our folks are beginning to understand is that the classic DCS system does a great job of providing trend alarms and alerts and alarms um, all that, that uh, triggered there, there's a problem right now. This gives you a chance to look at it uh, far in advance. And if you're tracking five or six variables on a pump or a mill or a crusher or a screen, you will get these uh, agents that give you an indicator that the equipment under surveillance 
has a potential likelihood of a future issue long before it arises and people can run a planned maintenance program. And it, it, most folks who tell you uh, or who, who study maintenance will tell you that planned work is uh, less expensive than unplanned work. Um, and I can't remember what that factor is. It's like a, a three, three X or something. Ed. And that it's also safer work, that you're much less likely to have incidents involved in, in planned maintenance activities than these unplanned activities that happen at two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday when you're scrambling to make up. And uh, have you noticed also that uh, that with them tell your ability to work both in the fixed plant with uh, mills and uh, also out of crushers and conveyors and so forth and having a single tool that operates across the different machines is uh, makes it easier for adoption? It, it really does. It really does. I, our next challenge, I think, is to make sure that we have a reliability engineer on each shift or that some of our control room staff have the ability to understand what MTEL looks like. Uh, again, because it predicts fairly far out in the future, it's not quite so critical that you get uh, the agents giving you a notification at two o'clock on a Sunday. Usually you get weeks in advance notice, um, so you can catch this on a day shift on a Monday through Friday. Um, but that's what we need to do is just expand that understanding that there's another way to let your data be reviewed by uh, a, a big data analytics AI uh, platform that is smarter than we are as people. Yeah, I think I think in many times folks find it a bit difficult to when they're trying to do their decision support systems to accept technology like this and realize it's actually pretty darn smart and capable of really helping you make those type of decisions. Um, it it sounds like uh, it sounds like you know, the adoption rate's going pretty well at your site. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, I think uh, you've got a, you've got a bit of taste of this. It sounds like you had quite a bit of success with them deploying MTEL and predictive prescriptive maintenance at your site. Um, what do you kind of see as your next steps uh, down this path uh, towards digitization, the digital mind? Well, one of, one of them obviously is this move uh, into the mobile um, uh, fleet that we have. And right now we've got about 15 assets under surveillance and fixed plant. And as I said, it's pretty diverse. It's ball mills, crushers, screen decks, pumps, filters, uh, a number of different kinds of pieces of equipment are amenable to this kind of uh, surveillance technique. Um, so that, that's one. I think the other is even for uh, the advances that we've made, Ed, we still have to keep expanding our digital footprint. Uh, there are conveyors that are not uh, adequately instrumented at this point. We need to get to work on that. Um, there, there are some pieces of data that we still uh, haven't imported into MTEL for surveillance. So those are some of the next steps is, is to really cement that, that appropriate digital footprint onto these old assets and uh, uh, to make sure that we expand it wherever we can, can create value in the value chain. And it's pretty wide. It sounds like you have quite a, uh, quite a solid plan there to really expand this. And uh, uh, I, I think that in many cases, you know, starting out small, proving to everyone that things work is a really good step towards uh, towards building the confidence necessary to allow expansion and getting all the stakeholders on board. Is that what you've seen? Yeah, absolutely. It works well. And and this has to be syndicated, not just with your crafts folks and uh, your supervisors and superintendents. We syndicated with the home office in Vancouver as well. So our, our uh, leadership team there understand the value of taking these, these old brownfield assets up to another level in capability. And I have to say to everyone, I've uh, I've visited Mike up at his site several times and uh, got a chance to talk to a lot of the folks out there. And it's very interesting to hear their perspective as they're going along this journey as well, echoing a lot of what Mike has said. So it's a it's a exciting thing to watch there at Pinto Valley, Mike. <laughs> so uh, just you know, now that you've got a lot of this under your belt, which is do you see your kind of your kind of the uh, experience getting now? What are the key lessons you've learned from this journey? And uh, do you have recommendations for folks who might be taking the first steps or kind of continuing their first steps or are kind of continuing the momentum of digitalization efforts at their sites? You're kind of asking, you know, what did you what you learn? Well, I, I learned a, a, a couple things. One is um, there, there are lots of, there are at least two big kinds of data out there. If I think about grouping it. And one is uh, the, the classic uh, machine data. So temperature, pressure, speed, flow, that kind of thing. Another one is there are some behavioral components of data out there. Um, and there's, there's new technology that the classic mine and mineral processing staff uh, maybe haven't thought a whole lot about. So if you look at uh, um, 
facial detection in uh, a fatigue management program where there's a camera inside the cab of a vehicle that now is not measuring temperature, pressure, flow. It's measuring uh, head position. You know, if you start to look down at your cell phone or at your lunchbox, well, you've got a deviation from the expected norm and you can have an alert pop up. So there, there's, there's a, a way to scrutinize different sets of data than we could classically become used to. And, and some of it's behavioral, uh, much of it is the, uh, the instrumentation on the machines. I think another lesson uh, that has stood out for me, not just at Capstone, but my previous experience at another mining company is if you want to start the journey, if you want to really move down this path, you've got at least two choices. One is, is you can have a chief technology offer at the C officer at the C-suite level in your business. And some folks do that. Um, not everyone does though, especially in mining and mineral processing, we're a little slower to take up some of this stuff than other industries are. But if you don't have a C-suite leader that made a directive that you will adopt and, and innovate with some of these new technologies, you've got to hire some people who have a passion for that and have an understanding of what those opportunities might look like. So if you don't have that C-suite uh, chief technology officer, um, hire some managers, some superintendents, some reliability folks who are really uh, switched on to these new tools and practices that can create value in your business. So that, that's at least a couple things I've learned um, that are helpful. Maybe the last one, Ed, is you, you've got to be curious. And if you want to put these solutions to work, you've got to uh, look for problems and, and ask yourself, well, how might you, you fix this problem? And I'll give you one small example. If we had a, uh, a desire to run our thickeners, our tailing thickeners, more consistently for underflow density, and it was pretty erratic, right? We had different performance across each of the crews and we asked ourselves, well, which one of our operators is, is the best one? And then we asked, well, could we duplicate that? And duplicating that across four different ships uh, takes a, a lot of uh, personal time, a lot of effort. And instead we focused on the control system. So how could we get our control system smart enough that they can behave like and replicate the um, capability of our best operator? So just being curious, what works really well and how can we rapidly get that to be the norm in the business? It's tough to do it with people. It's sometimes a little easier with the technology solution. Oh, that, sounds, that sounds fantastic, Mike. And I have to say, I really appreciate that type of thinking. I, I myself, in my experience, I've uh, run into quite a few cases where we demonstrated a best practice out at a mine site and uh, showed the clear value and optimization only to have someone say, but we've always done it this way. So we're just going to continue what we're doing. We don't want to do that. We do it this way. This is what we've done for years. This is what we should do. And yeah. so uh, it was very difficult to get that idea of cross of taking something that was clearly showing value and replicating it and moving it forward. So I think that's a fantastic lesson for every everyone to hear. And I think in addition, uh, if all the folks out there uh, have the type of support from the C-suite that can uh, help them, boy, that's that's definitely something something to to take advantage of and leverage to to do this because there's a lot of potential there. Any other comments or lessons you wanted to mention, Mike? Or well, maybe one. Um, we are a, a a lower ore grade um, mine. That's just the nature of our ore body. And what that means is, especially with some of the uh, the older technology that this this plant was built with in the 70s. Uh, we tend to reside on the, the higher side of the cost curve. And what I would say is for, for us, certainly, it's just crucial that innovation is part of what we do, specifically the lower unit cost. One of the best way to lower unit costs is to keep your uptime high, right? So get that, that numerator of tons, um, uh, or that denominator, excuse me, of, of uh, tons, uh, as large as you can get those dollars over an increasing the large uh, denominator. So we have got to be innovative at a site like ours where we have lower ore grades and we're an older uh, technology plant but the same is true for anybody if you don't get curious and you don't get connected to these new opportunities over time you'll find yourself on the wrong side of that cost curve not because your ore body is challenging and because your equipment maybe isn't the next generation but because others have got some ways to get uh, all their unit costs down with this these new ideas and tools well, that's a that's a really fantastic point, uh, Mike. And in my experience, I often when uh, folks were kind of shying away from new technologies, we heard different. I heard different excuses such as, "Oh, co the commodities aren't doing so well at this point, or prices are low." Different things. And I said, you know, this is the type of technology that helps you get your cost per unit down. 
gets things to uh, run more smoother and helps you operate to, in times where both times are good and times are a little more challenging. So that's a very interesting perspective for folks to hear. Thank mm -hmm. you. I, I think uh, I think uh, if uh, we could transition now that we've got a few questions here. So uh, we have some questions here that we might want to go ahead and visit. Steve. Okay. Um, one of the first questions to come in was, um, how do I know if I'm ready for a solution like this? So what if what if I don't have the best data or a data scientist team available? Well, uh, you know, we, we don't have a true data scientist here on site uh, either, Steve. We've got uh, some reliability engineers and, and good reliability engineers are tough to find. It's a competitive market, but they're out there. Um, if you bring someone who has this reliability centered approach, they'll have the basic understanding of, of monitoring the right variables in the, in the fixed plant or in the mobile equipment for that matter and connect them up with the, uh, the expertise that Aspen Tech and Mtel, and you'll have an implementation plan materialize pretty rapidly. So don't worry if you're not, uh, you know, you don't have a, a Google squadron working in your department in mining or mineral processing. Don't worry about that. Uh, start with talented people in the maintenance, connect them up with these folks who know data. And I'll, I'd like to add to that too as well, Mike. Uh, to tackle kind of what Mike is saying is that nowadays, uh, many of the tools such as MTEL are designed to operate where you don't need a data scientist involved. They tend to take, make it easier to integrate that data and turn it into something that you can use and that's your engineers, people already there on site uh, are able to utilize rather than having to have a whole team of scientists or a data analysts do that. And so taking advantage of tools like Intel and that are uh, kind of lowering the barrier to entry to being able to use this type of data analytics certainly is a, a step to help them to do that and making sure you partner with someone who can uh, make that, uh, again, lower the hurdles so that you can adopt fairly quickly and get the values because once you start to see the value, then the, the, you start to build momentum with insight and a lot of more folks are motivated to follow along and do more. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, a couple of people have asked, uh, how long does a solution like this take to implement? And um, how, how long before you start seeing uh, a return on your investment? It, it didn't take us long. We got uh, uh, assets under surveillance within a couple of months at most. And early, early results were that we were confirming um, what we thought were anticipated failures that were coming up. Uh, so it was able to model what, what we thought we knew was going to happen, and then it started to alert um, uh, potential failure modes that we didn't anticipate. So that that whole process of getting to the point where it's starting to find things that we might not have seen before probably took us about six or eight months. Um, but it's uh, um, on track to pay itself back, and uh, we're expanding. Okay. Um, this one's directed towards Mike. Um, how have you resourced the reliability team to make this a success? How we resourced it? We've got um, a reliability superintendent who works for our processing manager. Uh, we also have a reliability superintendent who works for the mine manager. And each of those reliability superintendents has uh, at least a couple of the more junior reliability engineers. Um, they also work very, very closely with our maintenance planners. This is that classic work management component that I talked about. So um, we don't have a large staff. Uh, we're, we're a total group of about 600 here at Pinto Valley. And we've, we've got perhaps six people who are truly dedicated to reliability engineering full time. And uh, most of those folks are now um, trained to use MTEL. Okay, very good. Well, I think that concludes today's session. Um, is there any more questions available? Uh, I see, I, I'm seeing a question here uh, on the chat that someone's asking about uh, the difference between prescriptive and predictive maintenance, I think would, oh, might, yeah. be, might be an interesting uh, thing to describe here really quick for everyone. So in this discussion, we've been using this term prescriptive versus predictive maintenance a bit. And so just kind of, since we've got a little bit of time here, I'll spend a moment to kind of describe the, a little bit of the differences. 
In many cases, uh, I love to use an example of your automobile because it's one of those things when we talk about maintenance on something, all of us are very familiar with doing that. So the example I like to use is imagine if the alternator on your car is failing and uh, what, how do you usually find out about that? So what usually happens is that uh, you get either start having issues with your battery not charging and you're stuck someplace or you get a warning light, right? That's all you get. That's all the warning you get when your alternator is failing. So the idea of predictive maintenance is that imagine now that when your alternator were failing in your car, you were told a week or two in advance, by the way, your alternator is failing. You don't have to do something about it right now, but you, you've got a you've got a certain time window to do something about this. So address this or at some point you're going to be stuck. OK, so now you have time to go say, oh, not today, but tomorrow I've got a time window. I'm going to go take this car in and get the alternator repaired. Prescriptive maintenance goes a step further. Now imagine not only did your car tell you that your alternator was going to fail. Imagine now your car said to you, your alternator is going to fail in two weeks. More or less, you get an idea that there's a chance your alternator is going to fail in two weeks. But the reason your alternator is failing is that we reported high temperature readings for a long period of time as you parked your vehicle in uh, various areas that you had a height, an unusual amount of time spent in high temperature. So now you know that the reason that your vehicle is your alternator is having issues is because it's constantly under high temperature. And now you can actually take an action prescriptively to prevent having future alternator failures at such a high rate because you had that type of data. And so the difference between predictive and prescriptive is not just being able to have an advanced warning of something happening, but having the context to be able to take a prescriptive action and process to actually change it. So I hope that answers that. Uh, I hope that answers that for uh, those who had any uh, questions on that. Yeah. Okay. We've had a uh, we've had a flurry of questions come in now. So let me, uh, uh, Mike. Uh, one of our uh, participants asks. You mentioned the next step of moving on to your mobile fleet. What are the challenges faced when implementing this system on mobile equipment versus fixed equipment? Um, I was talking to our, our mine manager about that yesterday, actually, and it sounds like what we'll have to do is do periodic downloads of data from our haul trucks. We won't have real time streaming of, you know, second by second information from each vehicle. And I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the, uh, the issue is there, Steve. I don't know if it's a, uh, a bandwidth issue in the mine. Um, we can still uh, take that data on a daily basis and give ourselves this advanced notification, you know, like Ed just said. Uh, even if you download it every day, if you get the intel that you may have a potential failure coming up in a couple of weeks, that's still adequate. Uh, we may have to invest in some more um, uh, data transmission uh, bandwidth in order to uh, adopt a, a real-time streaming mode, but that's one challenge that we're facing in the mobile equipment fleet right now. The advantage that we got in mobile equipment is um, most of these pieces of equipment, especially trucks, are, are, are very much the same. But once you get one vehicle under surveillance, you can put the whole fleet under surveillance and scale it immediately. Okay, we, we have a kind of a similar follow on question in this area where the, the, uh, the question is, did, did, did you have to enhance your actual sensors and instrumentation to feed MTEL correctly? Not to my recollection, most of the things, you know, that we talked about, so speed, vibration, temperature, pressure, uh, as long as they're recording in the DCS system appropriately, it was no problem at all for Intel to pick those up and, and uh, translate those into variables under surveillance. Okay. And yeah, so to, to add to that a little bit, Steve, and to Mike, I'd like to add to Mike's is that normally uh, it's likely that with the sensors that you many sites already have available, including the sensors that would come off of mobile equipment, that the data is more than good enough to be able to utilize tools like Intel. Uh, out there. So there's this constant feeling that, oh, I don't have enough sensors. My data is just not good enough or something. You'd be surprised at how these tools adapt well to use the data in many cases, as you may already have it. Uh, we give it a lot of sensing that is very commonly found in the field. So it's, it's certainly worth investigating. Okay. Um, this might be more towards you, Ed. I'm sure Mike, you can chime in if you want, but what what dashboard customization was required and how many man hours did it take to develop? Oh boy, I don't know that I can answer that one actually. I think you have to talk to the folks who are close to the work. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you probably have to chat with the maintenance uh, superintendents for that one. 
Okay. Yeah, there, there, effectively, too, I, I, I think uh, there's a lot of tools that allow data to be presented in a way that's uh, in a dashboard to be developed that best represent uh, the type of processes and workflows that exist on site. And we have, of course, been working closely with Mike and his team to do what uh, to implement the tools and bring in additional tools as, as needed to try to make this as easy as possible and intuitive for folks to be able to extract the information that they're seeing and not have to spend a lot of manual time getting into the details. Again, this kind of accentuates that fact we were talking earlier about not needing data scientists. The tools should make it to where anybody on site is able to utilize the outcome of the uh, it, the solution that's being employed like mtel and be able to easily see that outcome so it's actually since many of these dashboard tools already exist they could be rapidly implemented to create user interfaces and so dashboards that uh, for different types of users as needed okay and ed I, I think you kind of addressed this but another question is as i understand the technology you connect directly with equipment and sensors to capture the data so to, to get into kind of a little bit of the detail of that, typically what we're doing is that many sites and uh, production areas, that even outside of mining, have something, a data historian, something that's collecting sensing information and bringing it into a kind of a specialized database, a data historian that is uh, accumulating this information and allowing you to get some level of reporting and analysis that you might already be doing. MTEL can connect to any number of historians that are out there including IP21, our own historian, that takes that sensing information and makes it readily available to be ingested in Demtel right away. So this really makes it to where it's uh, easy to, uh, it's fairly quick to be able to take something like Demtel and plug into what is commonly found in sites and be able to utilize the information they might already have available. And if not, if that information and you don't know whether or not you have a historian or you don't, it's not not very difficult to begin that process of putting one in and starting to collect that valuable information. So I, I think that uh, I think that if you have any questions, any want to know any further details, just let us know and we'll certainly help you in that space. Okay, and and earlier, Mike, you you stressed the importance of change management and. Uh, one of the questions was, how have you approached the change management aspect of having your team trust new digital technologies? Um, I, I, wow, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that I've had anybody say they don't trust it. I mean, we're not big conspiracy theorists here. Um, as long as the sensors are properly calibrated, um, it's pretty easy to see the trend lines as we've always seen them. What we now see is um, uh, a capacity to give us a little more intelligence on where those trend lines might be indicating that there's a deviation from steady state operating. And I, I think ultimately what's building the trust and the willingness to go from fixed plant to mobile is we're getting some wins, all right? So we're, we're able to see some advanced prediction. We're able to uh, uh, head off a, a failure and, and intervene before it becomes a, an unplanned failure and, and uh, take it on in a planned fashion. So. That's probably the, the biggest way to build trust is, is just watching the system deliver. And part of what we try to do to assist in, the, in that process with new sites is that we always typically start with a pilot. And so what we say to you is don't trust us on this. Let's actually take data from your site, your operations, and let's put it through and you know what has happened in the past. So let's see if uh, we could have warned you. And so by doing that and building up the trust and saying, hey, these things have already happened. Let's run a pilot and do an offline pilot and take a peek and see what we do with your assets, your equipment to get and get a result and see how much warning we would have given you in that situation. That usually uh, does a whole lot to build confidence up front that this is not this is not smoke and mirrors. This is actual something that's truly providing you an answer that is real. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Ed. Uh, I want to let people know if uh, our panelists didn't have a chance to answer your question today during the session, we'll follow up with uh, you directly afterwards to address those questions. And that include that concludes today's uh, webinar. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us today. It was a pleasure. Thanks for the invite. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Steve.